Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, what I was growing up, one of my neighbours, two, two doors down, was one of the world's most famous rugby players, a chap called Bobby Windsor. Um, he was a bit of a character, superb rugby player, um, but a true story about Bobby, really, um, if I could. Uh, he went on tour with the British Lions, and they played South Africa, beat South Africa in South Africa, a very unusual event. Um, but during the tour, it was back in the days before uh, mobile communications, um, a team meeting was called, and uh, the management said, look, we've got a slight problem here. Somebody has been sneaking into the manager's office, making phone calls home, has run up a colossal bill. I would like to give you the opportunity to confess. Nothing. So they said, right, we're going to try and make this easier for you. Um, we know uh, the phone number that's been, been rung every time, and it is a Newport phone number. At which point, Bobby leapt to his feet and shouted, right, which one of you bastards has been phoning my wife? <laughs> so, the terrible thing is this is an entirely true story. <laughs> um, and I think the learning point is if you are going to cut corners, at least keep your wits about you. Um, uh, in terms of building on the other, the other talks, um, my, 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 my talk today, I was, I was going to try and pick bits from the other speakers, but there are so many bits to pick from. I'll, I'll just try and do a summary if I can. Um, and the whole tone of the talk is to try and justify the claim that you get the safety standards and the safety culture that senior management are prepared to accept. No more, no less. Everything else is just detail and case study. And I honestly believe that to be entirely true. I'll give you a, a, just a very simple example. We work with a lot of mining companies back in the UK. Um, and one in particular, about 10 years ago, there was a, a funeral. Um, they killed somebody. They were very average in terms of their safety standards. And they killed somebody. And the MD went to the funeral and was approached afterwards by the wife of the person who'd been killed. Um, and he was very worried about this. He wondered what was coming. But she took him to one side and said, I just wanted to thank you for showing the respect to come and bury my husband. And he found that unexpected um, interaction very moving and resolved on that day that he would transform the safety culture of the company. It's called Lafrage, for what it's worth. Um, and 12 years later, they are head and shoulders above everybody else in the industry. You, know? uh, and you often see that. Um, hopefully, this talk is all about being world class without following from a fatality. Obviously, there are instances in your industry where you don't become world class even following infamous fatalities. Um, so, in terms of uh, the, the, the justifying that expression, I think there are really three things we can talk about. The first one is everything we've talked about today, you know, um, all the different talks that you've had, particularly about transformational leadership and so on, um, but also uh, the systems and the procedures. And really, my talk assumes that your systems, your procedures, your policies, your training, your inductions, all that uh, is in place, or at least it's, it's broadly in place and you're trying to refine it. And the rest of the talk really will all be about a thing called just culture um, from James Reason's work. When, you know, James Reason says that you know, what we need to do is to understand why things are happening and learn from it. So very much, uh, if, you, if you don't understand, can I, can I just do a, a head count for you? How many of you have heard the term just culture and really understand what it means? Okay, great. Well, for the rest of you, um, you're not allowed to leave unless you agree with me that just culture is the way forward, right? But I'll, I'll, try, and, I'll try and justify that. Um, an overarching model of human error that I think is useful here um, is basically uh, HSG 48, we call it, which is set a job up so that it's unlikely something will go wrong by good ergonomics and design, all that transformational leadership stuff of getting people involved in the job you know, at the design stage so they most own what they help create. Then secondly, make it really easy to spot that something has gone wrong and then make it really easy to recover from the thing that's gone wrong once you've spotted it. And that's a very simple model, and if you're doing that systemically and, and effectively, you will be covering your human factors. And it's very analogous to Reason's model of a vulnerable company. You know, if you become overstretched, and all companies become overstretched, how quickly do you realize that you're overstretched, and how quickly can you snap back? And one of the key things he says is, that needs to be practiced. You know, obviously very analogous to the, um, what was it, the uh, Papa, you know, that Rick was talking about. You know, you practice your response so it becomes second nature. And really the talk is, is a lot about that. Okay, um, so this, this is me. Um, if, if you're interested in my talk, there's a book that I wrote that, uh, that, you, that you, can, you can buy or, or ask me for. And this is where we've worked uh, really all, all over the world in the last couple of years. So if I say I, I hold this to be generically true, I mean, I mean you know, internationally rather than Europe-wide. Um, what I will try and do is try and make this whole thing interactive, if I can. So I'll ask for volunteers. So, uh, you know, we talked about transparency and openness. 
If I ask you honest and open questions, will you chip in and help me out? Pass the next 40 minutes as quickly as we can? No? Okay, well, if I could have a yes, please, that would be great. Okay, great. Okay, how many of you are swingers? You know, sex clubs, wife swapping, that sort of thing. You know, we're only one question in, and already you're not being honest with me. I, don't know. I, I, I am saying sex swapping, by the way. A couple of weeks ago, I did something with a council in London, and a woman at the back put her hand up and said, yeah, twice a week, if I can, because she thought I'd said swimming, which was... <laughs> <laughs> kind of had to be there, but it was... We, well, we laughed anyway. <laughs> Okay, so seriously, I know uh, a good table full of you will have had a go, so if you could just make yourself known, please. No? Okay. Okay, a, se a serious question. I, I do know this is a, um, a mixed and professional audience. Uh, how many of you, oh, in my day, there was a program called Euro Trash. There was a French fella that used to introduce it. They used to forever be hanging around these sorts of places. A, a genuine question for you. I'm assuming we all know what happens there. If you went to one for the first time, what would you do? If you went to a sex club for the first time, <laughs> what would you do? And it's a mixed and professional audience, so be careful with the, <laughs> the answer. Find the emergency exit. Find the emergency exit. <laughs> uh, very planned and organized of you. <laughs> can, can, I suggest, uh, can I suggest you'd find a corner, get a drink, and watch what everybody else was doing? Does that sound about right? But for what it's worth, I was involved in the Cullen Inquiry, the second Cullen Inquiry in the UK. Um, and our task was, what is safety culture? How do you measure it? How do you define it? How do you change it? Um, and the definition we came up with was, your safety culture is what is typical or unremarkable. Very analogous to all the Scott Geller stuff about, you know, he's, he was the first person to say, hey, look, stop calling safety a top priority. Priorities are uh, political and priorities change. It's got to be an embedded core value. It's got to be what we do you know, systemically all the time without even thinking about it. Rick was talking about that sort of thing. Yeah. So anyway, so your safety culture is made up of day-to-day of -day behaviors, the stuff that goes on. So your new starts and your subcontractors, the first thing they will do when they arrive on site is they will find a corner, metaphorically, and they will have a good look around to see what everybody else is doing. Now, you know, yeah, yeah, the behaviors they're looking at, everything from the obvious stuff, like holding the handrail, compliance with PPE, through to more interesting things like plant-person interaction, um, and then the, the really interesting stuff, like what is the voice tone of a supervisor giving a toolbox talk or a weekly brief? You know, are they doing it with ownership and passion and confirming understanding? Or is it something they just kind of knock off, sign here, and I don't even care if you only speak Polish? Yeah. You know, but these are the events that, that, that define your safety culture. It's not what it says above the door. When you walk into a pub that says a warm Irish welcome guaranteed in this pub, it's not necessarily true. Your safety culture isn't what we say it is, it is what it actually is. And we respond to that and pick it up really quickly. Now on a practical level, so you walk in, um, there are these key behaviors going on. If you've got 50% compliance and 50% non-compliance, you've got free choice. You can do what the hell you like and you're not going to stand out. But if we can get these key behaviors up over a certain tipping point of around 90%, they become self-reinforcing. And your new starts and your subcontractors will fit in with that. Does that make sense to you? So really, I think, you know, whether you call it safety leadership work, behavioral safety, uh, safety culture change, your key, your key thing is, what are the key behaviors that set the tone? Let's get them up over 90%. And if you all agree with that, we can all go home. That's great. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, if, you, if you're interested, there's a, a very famous book called The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. Um, it was Bill Clinton's favorite book, apparently, uh, full of useful, useful stuff. Um, what I'd like to do now is very briefly talk uh, a bit about behavioral safety, then get into human error and just culture, and then finally finish with a model that I think explains an awful lot of what goes wrong when we're out there trying to achieve what we're trying to achieve. Um, first thing is, is behavioral safety, key messages of behavioral safety. Um, here's a man um, walking and safely down some stairs on an oil platform. Now, in, you know, my understanding is in the North Sea, about 50% of all LTIs are caused by walking down the stairs unsafely. You know, cost of the, the industry tens of millions, I believe. Um, now, the likelihood of this chap falling, though, is about 100,000 to one. And two things flow from, from that figure. The first one is, if he's lucky, he might get away with it indefinitely, finish his entire career w without falling down the stairs. And the second thing is, 
as a supervisor, I've got a good excuse not to challenge them because it's actually extremely unlikely that he'll hurt himself on a given day. So blind eye syndrome is kind of justified. But the thing is, if those stairs are used a million times a year and the ratio is 100,000 to one, which probably is about, about, nobody holds the handrail, you will have 10 LTIs a year. If we can persuade 90% to hold the handrail, we will have one LTI a year, give or take. And if we can persuade 99% to hold the handrail, we'll only have an LTI every 10 years or so. And we really are then into this kind of uh, zero accident, you know, zone. Yep. So, you know, you're, you're all familiar with Heinrich's triangle, of course. You know, the bigger the bottom of the triangle, the bigger the top. But the smaller the bottom of the triangle, the smaller the top. Um, which is really useful for, for, for this reason, which is that behaviours, as we've already heard today, combine often to cause accidents. A very simple one from my hometown of Newport. Um, anybody know Newport at all? Well, for what it's worth, it's a really interesting place, <laughs> full of very cultured, intelligent people. Right? That's important you know how cultured and intelligent Newport is <laughs> for the purposes of a, of, a, of a joke coming up. Um, you have three behaviours anyway, from the bottom of Heinrich's Triangle. Uh, no, no bombing of objects, no throwing things. Um, stick to the walkways, don't take shortcuts between workbenches. And, and finally, uh, if you've got any uh, air-powered tools, you know, that you, they're powered up but not using, make sure you holster them safely out the way. Um, this is a, a true case study of a chap who took a shortcut, and as he did so, he walked past an air-powered nail gun that was powered up but not holstered out the way. And as he did that, somebody threw something in the general direction of a skip, causing him to, to start, and he managed to start into the nail gun. Now, he was okay, finished his shift, um, came in the next day, worked through, and it wasn't until the day after um, that he was at a rugby match in Cardiff, jumping up and down, cheering his team on, came over all peculiar, keeled over, taken off to the local hospital, see if they could work out what was wrong with him. And this is the precautionary x-ray that came back. Right. Luckily, being from Newport, missed his brains by a good six feet. <laughs> okay. okay. The key point, of course, is, uh, as I'm sure you all know, you don't need to get all three behaviours right to save such an accident. You just need to break the chain and get any one right. Yeah. Um, to take in, so, so we can, the, the thing that you find with, with good behavioural safety is you just work the bottom of the triangle, and like Gary Player, you make your own luck. The famous golfer said, like, isn't it funny, the harder I practice, the luckier I seem to get. You know? And the truth is, you will, if, you, if you have the bottom of the triangle, you will have the top, but you'll never know who it is that isn't hurt, if you see what I mean. You just work the odds and make your own luck. This next example, um, I'll just stop it there, uh, tries to tie a few of these things together. And um, what we've got here is, is a chap who is proactive. Um, have I got a, a pointer you can see? You've got this chap here. I'm, I apologize for the poor quality of the DVD, it's, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's real life footage. This chap is going to do uh, an unsafe behavior. He's got to do a U-turn. Um, and this chap is going to follow him out. And then we're going to introduce a third person. And the important thing about the third person is they are compliant. They are driving at the speed limit and they've got every right to be on the inside or the outside lane. Unfortunately, they're compliant, but they're not proactive. And I'll show you what happens next. Um, unfortunately, the chap didn't survive that. That's, uh, that's unfortunately a fatality. So he was compliant, but he's not proactive. Very interesting finding uh, uh, from meta-analysis over the last couple of years is involvement in safety and, and thought about safety actually correlates better with accident rates than broad compliance. But so all that transformational leadership stuff about getting the workforce involved in thinking about and planning their own safety correlates better than broad compliance. And if that sounds counterintuitive and you think, oh, it doesn't make sense, imagine you've got a 10-year-old child, as, as I have, and we have a thing called a pelican crossing in the UK. You press the button, you wait, it tells you that it's green and you can go. You know, would you prefer your child to press the button and walk without looking when it went green? Or would you want them 50 yards down the road crossing but genuinely, dynamically risk assessing as they went? Okay. Now, the... As a, uh, an interesting case study for me for this, I did some team training once for um, an oil company, um, o OMV, um, in London we were, and uh, I was team training with a guy from the SAS who was teaching some of the managers about U-turns and, and escaping people in Nigeria and so on. And he jumped up and he said something really interesting. He said, look, 
this simply wouldn't have happened to me. So like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm ex-SAS, uh, special services. Uh, um, I'm very risk tolerant. I'm a pretty robust individual. I ride motorbikes. I like to ride motorbikes really quickly. But this wouldn't have happened to me because I'm really risk averse. I'm risk tolerant, but I'm also risk averse. And what he said was, look, what I'd have done is I'd have realized that this road curved, reducing my visibility. I'd have followed the rule about being proactive on the road. Always give yourself the time and space to deal with not only your own mistakes, but with the mistakes of others. Yeah. Number two, assume everybody else out there is a drunken idiot, uh, particularly if they're frustrated. And I would have automatically slowed down, he said, and moved to the inside lane just to give myself some space. That's what he said. And I really think the very best behavioral safety is simply trying to create that mindset that you are genuinely risk aware at all times and reacting to that as you go about your daily life. You know, you really embed it and uh, take it on board in the way that Scott Geller describes. You know, it's genuinely embedded, that, that risk perception. Okay. Okay. Um, which brings us to, um, ho hopefully, an interactive part of the, uh, the session, if we could, as we build up to Just Culture. I wonder if I could get a volunteer. Any volunteer at all would do well. That gentleman at the back's trying to sneak out. That'll do. <laughs> Yeah. Anybody, please? Thank, thank God for that. <laughs> if you could come on stage, please. And as a, as a reward for volunteering, if you could pick somebody to come on stage with you. Great idea. Yes, but any, anybody you like, and, and the shyest one possible, ideally. Oh, that's a hard one. Yeah. Peter, come on. <laughs> He's, he's a local. Okay, well, well, while, your, while your friend is making his way to the stage, what I'd like you to do is a simple, simple physical task. If you could just stand on your left leg and rotate your right leg like so. Any problem with that? Okay, you can do that. Okay. And yourself, if you could point at the ceiling and simply draw a nice big figure of six in front of you like that. Any problem with that? Okay, great. And so for the amusement of the, uh, the audience, if you could try and do the two things simultaneously, please. Yep, so one figure of six and the clockwise foot. <laughs> if, you could, if you could all stand up and have a go, please. That's, okay. Anybody fancy? Oh, good Christ. <laughs> Anybody fancy they can do it at all? You should find it almost physically impossible, for it's worth. But ideally not dangerous. Okay, if you, if you, could, all, if you could all sit down, please. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, if, uh, a round of applause, please, for the volunteers. Okay. Okay. Um, obviously, should you set a task up that requires you to do the two things simultaneously, you're going to get lots of error. <laughs> okay. Um, just, just said that. Uh, another volunteer, please. Gentlemen, if you could pick somebody, the gentleman just sitting down, if you could pick somebody to stand up, please, since you volunteered last. Okay. Excellent. What, what I'd like you to do, if you could, is that you can, you can do it from there, that's okay. Um, I'm looking at my, uh, my person with a microphone. They said they'd uh, cover it. If you could basically read out as loudly as you can, please, in the absence of a microphone. Oh, there, there she comes now. All right. Uh, the following text, if you could. Okay. Just read it out as boldly and as clearly as you can, please. <laughs> now have a go. I couldn't believe that I could actually understand what I was reading. The phenomenal power of the human mind According to research at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter in what order the letters are in a word, are. <laughs> yeah. Right? Keep, oh, yeah, oh, just, yeah. That, the, the, you know, the rest can be a complete mess and you can still make sense of it. That's excellent. A round of applause again, please, for the... Yeah. 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 Uh, because the, the good news is we, we have to make sense of things really quickly or we'd never get to the end of a busy day. The bad news is, because of that, we often make mistakes as we, as we go about. And the following one, this is, if you could just focus on the black cross um, in the middle. Oh, hello, why isn't it playing? Somebody could, uh, that's not good. 
Come on. Why isn't it doing? Oh, I don't know that at all. Oh, bugger. I, it is, that's supposed to be circling. I have no idea why it's not. Um, it'll be because of something to do with the Apple, Apple computer, I guess. Anyway, what, what, what you would normally see is a green dot starts to circle around, and even though all the purple dots remain there, you can't see them anymore, uh, which is great to describe and really hopeless just on. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Um, uh, the reason for putting that up is it's very analogous to, we had a, I was involved in the Cullen Inquiry into Ladbroke Grove, and what we had there was a train driver drove straight past a red light. Now, instantly, the operating company came in and said, well, human error. You know, basic human error. He's obviously not been paying attention. But when we looked into it, um, what we found was this, this signal was the second worst in all of Britain for being passed at danger. They call them SPADs, signals passed at danger. So there's a very strong likelihood that this guy was paying full attention and he just couldn't see it. Yep. Just as none of you can see this circling green dot that's... <laughs> Okay, so uh, that didn't work very well, did it? Really, um, what I'd like to do now is just to have some fun with you um, to introduce a thing called ABC analysis, which is the last of the causes of human error that I want to describe before getting into just culture. Um, I wonder if you could all stand up for me, please. Great. Uh, well, what I'd like to do is I'd like to read out a list of things that you might be guilty of, okay? Um, what I would like you to do is to sit down at the end of the list, if you are guilty of any of them. Okay? Do not sit down as you get caught under any circumstances. <laughs> okay? are you get, from, from a list, at the end of the list, sit down if you're guilty of any of the following. Driving at 50% above the speed limit. So, you know, 100 kilometers an hour in a, in a, 50, in a 70, mile, a 70 kilometer an hour zone. Driving just after a, a, a traffic light has changed from amber to red by kind of looking in the direction of travel and accelerating into it. Driving when you think you're under the drink drive limit, but you're a bit uncertain because you've had a glass of wine more than you intended or a beer or so. So if you were stopped and breathalyzed, you'd be anxious about it. Um, smoking. Anybody smoke? Anybody ever taken a drug given to them by a friend rather than a doctor? Anybody ever drunk their weekly allowance of alcohol in a single 24-hour session? Anybody ever watched the marathon on the TV and said, that's me next year, that is, I'm going to get fit and I'm going to cut down on the booze and stretching exercises. Your last visit to the gym cost you about 700 pounds, or whatever that is in Krona. Anybody in the last 20 years or so, 25 years or so now, um, had any unprotected sex with a relative stranger? No idea where they've been or who with, but they look kind of healthy and wholesome, so it'll probably be all right. Anybody had any sort of sex you shouldn't have had, because if your partner finds out you're in real trouble, but you've had that weekly allowance of alcohol, all bets are off. If you're guilty of any of those, please sit down. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anybody tempted to shout house there? <laughs> That's good one. Yeah. Often in a factory, we get a young lad in the front row who says, last week, yes. <laughs> The, the reason for going through that is to uh, back up a thing that Oscar Wilde said he could resist everything except temptation. Um, um, we have a more modern comedian called Stephen Fry, you might not know. I mean, he says that what I do with temptation is I yield to it straight away, saves on the faffing about. Um, why, why that's amusing is what we do with temptation is we give in to it. You're not always, um, you know, and not everything, but often. Now, you know, uh, the thing about uh, behavior is a lot of people, particularly compliance-driven organizations assume that behavior is driven by the rules, the regulations, the policies, and the procedures. But actually, behaviors are much more driven by the consequences. Now, consequences can be three things. They can be soon or delayed, certain or uncertain, positive or negative. And if you find something with a soon, certain, and positive consequence, what you find is people are very tempted to crack on and, and, and do it, whether it's having a beer more than they intended, driving the car too fast, or all the other stuff. That, you know, that I, that, I, that I listed. Now, the consequences that are uncertain, negative, and delayed can be incredibly important. Oh, they'll kill you. Things like diabetes, heart disease, cancers, HIV. You know, but they kill millions of people all the time. Because what happens is we give in to the day-to-day -day temptations and we let the long-term stuff take care of itself. And why this is important for work is we do not turn into logical automatons when we get to work. When we get to work, we stay the same sort of people we were outside of work as uh, Bill Clinton, 
did, for example. You know, or, you know, or Tiger Woods. <laughs> you know, the trouble with temptation is we give in to it. You know, why this is important is, as a worker, if the Safeway is slow, inconvenient, uncomfortable, or just makes me stand out from my colleagues, I will be really tempted to cut a corner and crack on. And if I'm tempted to cut a corner and crack on, it is merely a head count from then on as to how many people do and how quickly the bottom of the triangle fills up. Here's, a, here's an example in the UK. Um, as a rule of thumb, whoops, you, you'll all be familiar with the um, expenses scandal. They were all, all they were overclaiming on expenses. So as a rule of thumb, if there is a temptation to do something wrong, 40% plus will do it and 1% plus will get themselves in real trouble. We've just jailed the third MP that we, that we caught. About 45% had to pay money back for over, overclaiming. That's not the scientific figure, 45, and when I just kind of made that up based on <laughs> these guys. Yeah. But I think that it holds. If you've got a serious temptation to act in safely because it's quick, convenient, comfortable, or everybody else does, I guarantee you that the bottom of the triangle is filling up. Uh, so, what, what can you do about it? Well, um, very quickly, all sorts of things, but, but one that a lot of organizations don't do as well as they could is they don't ask why. So, if you see an unsafe behavior, the first thing to do is to apply the Elvis rule. You know, walk a mile in a man's shoes before you judge them and ask the question why. But you don't ask it aggressively, you ask it curiously. Why did you do that? Because often you'll learn something of use. Even better um, is to ask the question, Anything slow, uncomfortable, or inconvenient about doing this job safely? Because if the answer to that is yes, I guarantee you've got a systemic temptation that will cause lots and lots of unsafe behavior, which inevitably in time will cause an accident. And if you go out and you do a little head count by, you know, somebody before said, uh, you know, don't, don't ask you, should you, ask do you. Walk, you know, if, if, you, if you're interested, ask your workforce, when was the last time somebody asked you a curious why question? When was the last time somebody asked you anything slow and comfortable about doing your job safely? Well, I guarantee you the scores will be, will be poor, probably. Um, so the opportunity to improve and become much more of a learning organization is, is, you know, is readily apparent. All you have to do is double up the number of times it's happening now. Which brings us to um, so, some ways that we can influence behavior. Um, there are lots and lots of ways of influencing behavior, but I just wanted to talk about two or three that I find particularly interesting. Um, this is a toilet in Shipall. Um, with a, very famously, if you, if you know this sort of stuff, with a fly painted on the, on the, on the to toilet. How many of you are familiar with nudge theory? Okay, well, for what it's worth, the UK government, David Cameron and, and his lot, very influenced by nudge theories, a book by a chap called Thaler, if you're interested. Um, and what nudge theory says is, it's not best, the, almost the worst way to get somebody to do what you want them to do is to tell them to do it. But if you can kind of nudge them into doing it, your quid's in. And you nudge, nudge theory in action, this is the, the first and the most famous of the nudges um, about a, a, a fly on the, on the urinal. Basically, you can't help, if you're a man, obviously, you can't help but point at it. Consequently, splashing <laughs> is reduced by 50%. You know, with a saving in, uh, in splashing and, and a saving in cleaning materials and environmental impact and so on. Well, serious question for you though. Can anybody stand up and give me a policy, a procedure, a rule, uh, a, a method of supervision that could match that 50% reduction? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> Please, a round of applause. <laughs> it's not my day today, is it? What with a spinny? <laughs> so, a, <p> <laughs> a, <n> <laughs> I, I've got to give up. Thank you. Um, a nudge in reverse. This is our uh, esteemed prime minister of recent times. Um, I had a client. Uh, still, uh, as you can see, it's not, not, not this visit, but a similar visit. He went to launch a ship for a company uh, that's on the screen. And they gave him all his PPE and said, you know, you have to put all this on before you can go out. It's a, it's a different visit than this one, but it, it illustrates. Um, and he, he put it all on, including a hat in this instance, but he handed the goggles back. And he said, I can't wear these. I'm as good as blind. You probably don't know that, but I've only got one eye. The other one doesn't work very well. Can't wear these. And the senior management team in question, a guy called Vic Emery and his, and his team, they had a quick chat, and they, uh, they decided, well, the, the lads out there will understand, you know. 
we'll let him go. So they let him go, and he walked around the yard without his PPE on, all his PPE on. How do you think that played with the workforce? Well, really badly. You know, if, if Vic was here now, he'd say, look, uh, I've paid for that decision every day since, you know, every week since. In every toolbox talk, every weekly brief, particularly every disciplinary. What about Gordon Brown then? You know, one of the golden rules of transformational leadership or anything else, really, is if you ever, as a leader, fail to follow your own rules, everything underneath you can collapse like a deck of cards. You've got, and the bad news is, it's not just the really senior people who are leaders. Every supervisor, every charge hand, just an experienced worker who's been around for a long time and people look to them. They're all safety leaders as well. So I'm afraid a nudge in reverse is, you know, you, you can't ever not follow your own rules. Um, so, some others, uh, there are lots and lots of others, but just to give you some ideas of the sort of stuff that's out, that's out there, um, an interesting nudge would be the word but. And studies have shown that the word but in the middle of a sentence essentially means everything I've just said, ignore, the important stuff's coming up. So get this job done safely, but get it done by Friday means something very different from get it done by Friday, but do it safely. And the interesting thing is that works apparently at a subconscious level. So you know, the person speaking and the person on the receiving end might be unaware of how the message was communicated, but communicated it is. Another interesting one is, is that I, if you, are, if you need somebody to make a promise, you're doing a safety inspection, you've come across something that you've done your five whys, but you're left with, you have to just stop doing that or start doing this, whatever it is, because A, we can't do anything about it, um, the place is built now, or B, we can do something about it, but no time soon, so I'll be needing you to act safely in the meantime. Did you know that a promise made by somebody who looks you in the eye and uses the word I is three times less likely to be broken than a promise that's made by, yeah, sure. Hmm. So, you know, if you're on a beach and somebody says to you, I wonder if you could look after my, my kit while I take my children for an ice cream, and you, say, and you look them in the eye and you say, yes, I will, yeah, you'll stay there forever, won't you? Does that still apply in Denmark? Yeah. But if you ask somebody, I wonder if you could look after my kit while I take the kids off for an ice cream, it'll only be 10 minutes, and the person you ask says, sure, yeah. Would you trust them? No. So there, there are all sorts of uh, little things based on how we see the world and how, how the world works that we've internalized over the years that can have a dramatic impact on a safety inspection and a safety conversation. Final one, of course, is praise. Um, you know, praise is 20 times as effective as criticism in changing somebody's behavior. Every safety culture survey we've ever done, we get the answer back. We never get anywhere near enough praise. So there's always an opportunity there. Um, our, you know, in, in the UK, people don't like using praise, but there is a technique that's really simple, stolen from the world of psychology, uh, educational psychology, that, that's really useful. In fact, um, there's a company uh, that makes submarines uh, in Portsmouth in, in the UK, and this is their entire behavioral safety program. The one in 10 technique taken from education, which is how good are you at safety one to 10? Well, you'll ask yourself, how good a driver are you in one to 10? Seven, maybe. Okay, great. Now, the important thing is that I follow up with, uh, why aren't you a naught? And you tell me all the good things that you do that justify a seven. So I nod and I murmur and I say, well done. Well, I'm impressed. Yeah. Okay. And then when I switch hats and say, but you know what my job is? I'm a safety coach, eh? You know, I've got to have the unsafe behaviors. If I can get you from a seven up to an eight and a half, that's my job done for today anyway, yeah? How can we get you up to an eight and a half? Can you see that by going the long way around, we're much more place to have a really good conversation, and any promises that you make are much more likely to be kept. So for what it's worth, uh, Babcock International, they make submarines, and that is their entire behavioral safety program. The 12 safety reps walk around once a week, stopping people and saying, rate yourself on safety one to 10, and then following that up. And they say that all the other stuff about learning, uh, you know, five whys and ABC analysis flows naturally from that. So. And which brings us to, to this, which uh, has been appled, I notice again, um, which is basically um, the thing that I really want to talk about today. Um, this is the just culture model of, of, uh, of human error, which basically says everything we do that's unsafe can be one of two things. It could be an error, uh, which could be caused by a lack of training or the way the job is set up. You can't do this simultaneously. You can't see the 
green dot circling, yeah? Or it could be a lack of training. Nothing to do with the individual. It's, it's not about the person. The other side of the fence is much more interesting. The other side of the fence says, uh, is a violation. Now, a violation could be down to the individual. You know, I'll do what I like because I'm alone to myself. But there's two other uh, violations that are interesting. Sorry about the, the, the apple zapping this, but the first one is an optimizing violation, which is based very much on the stuff that we've been talking about. An optimizing violation is, I did it because I thought that's what you really wanted me to do. Now, where did I get that from? Because you got the but in the wrong place in the sentence. Because um, when you said, you came down and you said, I've been told to come down and tell you. Or because I did a job last week where everything was done, there were no near misses to report, but I cut a few corners and you know I cut a few corners. The feedback I got was, hey, good job, well done. Absolutely guaranteeing that I will go out and do it again next week. If you want to be emotive about it, you could call that grooming. The other interesting one is a situational violation, which is under the circumstances, I felt I had absolutely no option but to do it that way. So, you know, once you've got uh, people out in gangs, people working on their own and so on, it gets very interesting, especially when you've got piecework and contractors. But a, a very typical example would be, uh, imagine a person um, on a forklift truck driving test, and they approach the load, they stop, they apply the handbrake, they commence lifting the load, pass the test, get your license, crack on with your job. Have you ever seen a forklift truck driver do that in anger? And if you did, what time would they be going home of an evening? Now, there's still a behavioral distinction to be made between the person who drives around with their forks raised willy-nilly and the sort of person who only commences lifting the forks two pallets out, so it's a nice smooth lift and the onus is almost entirely on somebody running through. But nobody actually follows the rules. If they did, work to rule wouldn't be such an effective union tactic. So for what it's worth, if you step back and look objectively yeah, at, uh, at a situation, you'll find eight or nine times out of ten that there is at least a semi-sensible reason for the person acting unsafely. And if that's the case, and it is, you need to spend 80 to 90% of your resources and time analyzing and facilitating and changing. And only 10 to 20% saying to the workforce, try harder, take more care. And what we find is a lot of organizations get kind of stuck in a wheel. More regulations, more rules, more training, follow it up more, more inspirational speakers. And they spend 80% of their time focusing on the person and only 10% of their time focusing on the environment, which I think is just backwards. Okay, so for what it's worth, um, just culture, it should, I, I think, should be the cornerstone of every organization that is broadly compliant and is looking to push forward. This is the sort of thing that people are doing for best practice. It's a just culture model it's from the oil industry in the UK. And basically, um, you won't be able to read this, um, but what it's saying is, it's out and out human error, get in an, an ergonomist. Or, now, that's a violation caused by us and the culture. Or, at this end, actually, no, it's them. Hit them. Okay. So, there's a question for you, which I hope will be rhetorical. Imagine a person who is perfect, absolutely perfect, in terms of their behavior. They turn up at work on the first day. They sit at the front in, the, in their induction. They pay attention. They take notes. Yeah. You know, they ask questions, they go out to the workplace, and they put their, put their coat on. They've got a picture of my child in the pocket just to remind myself where I'm going to be safe. They couldn't have a better attitude to safety if their life depended on it. But as they start going to work and go the long way around, whatever that might entail, um, somebody, uh, the, the old hands see them. Nobody says anything, but there's lots of nudging and so on. And Get them? Yeah. How long do you think that new start will carry on going the long way around? All week, all day, all morning. And when they do start taking the shortcut, is that an individual violation or is that a situational cultural violation? I said, I'm hoping that's a rhetorical question and you all agree it's the latter. Please shout if you disagree. So you know, I, I think an, an analysis of, of culture is hugely important. 
Um, and this is what companies do. They, they, through human resources, it's vital that it's through human resources, you train this sort of thing so that all your management apply these principles and go through these systemic questions. Any, any, any uh, safety leadership training course will have a, an exercise that says describe a really good leader and people will describe a really good safety leader and all the stuff will be generic. They're honest, they're trustworthy, they're open-minded, they listen well, they involve, they coach, they praise, all that stuff. Yeah? No, but key, key about, among it, consistency, fairness, object, objectivity. Well, this sort of stuff designs that in. And the last slide, um, what, why do so many companies spend an awful lot of money on stuff that looks really good in terms of training, but doesn't actually seem to deliver? Um, and this is a, a paper I wrote, if you're interested, I'd be really happy to send it to you, that I, I think describes why an awful lot of us spend so much time uh, wasting our time on training. It's, it's called Vroom's Model of Motivation. And Vroom's Model of Motivation says, an individual's motivation to do anything is a factor of three things multiplied. And the fact that it's multiplied is vital because without uh, a low score anywhere, and you're in trouble. And the first thing is, you need to tell me who's responsible, because if two people think they're responsible, nobody is. Then, uh, you need to tell me what to do, but most importantly, almost, you need to tell me why you want me to do it. You know, what is uh, all the stuff we've talked about, model safe behavior, challenge, do some behavioral analysis. Um, the why, though, because of Heinrich and break the chain and just culture and so on. And what you find is, if you tell people what but not why, they go off half-cocked. And if, you, if they need any flexibility, they haven't got that background of knowledge to, to react. And we've heard that today several times. Then you multiply that by how to do it. You've got your basics, how to give a basic presentation so you can do a good toolbox talk, and all the fancy stuff that I'm talking about now. But what you find, again, if you do analysis is, if a frontline supervisor feels they can't do it well, they will look for every opportunity possible not to do it at all in case they make a fool of themselves. So, good training courses based on good gap analyses cover all this really well, and off they go. Unfortunately, you then have to multiply it by the third thing, which is, do they actually genuinely value the outcome? Now, for some of us, you know, we have a passion for safety, you're a self-selecting sample here to, to an extent, um, and that's in, in built. But for your average frontline supervisor, they need to be taught to value safety. And they have to be taught in two ways. Firstly, through formal appraisals. Um, so, you know, is, is safety in the appraisal system? Yeah. And if it is, is it given due weight, or is it something you just skip over to get to the important stuff? And secondly, you know, is it followed up informally by the organization? Uh, Aubrey Daniels, who's probably the leading American in this field, says, look, um, by informal follow-up, I mean the following thing. Um, I see somebody doing something safe, a tick. Yeah. Um, I see a supervisor praising somebody for doing something safe, two ticks. I see a manager notice a supervisor praise somebody for doing something safe, and he later finds the supervisor to thank them for it, three ticks. Oh, is that sort of stuff systemically going on in your organization? So a uh, safety professional in my, in my acquaintance says, look, basically, you know, if what we've asked them for here isn't considered career enhancing in the smoke shack two months from now, you've wasted your money. Because it's not going to be happening. And for what it's worth, I think that describes how we spend a lot of money on good quality training that doesn't actually get us more than three months in, and you get the famous safety wave. Good improvement for three months and then back to where we were before. I'm sure you've all, a lot of you out there will have safety figures that look like that. Where you're thinking we really need to focus in on the human factors and we keep giving people good training but it's not sticking. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, what I'd like to do is I'd like to finish with uh, two, two true stories. Um, this is my old friend Ian. He was my best friend in safety. Unfortunately, he paralyzed himself in a fall in, uh, in Liverpool some years ago. Um, he then dedicated his life as a, as a safety, uh, safe, inspirational safety speaker. And he used to finish with, with two key points. And if you don't mind, I'll finish with the same two key points. The first one was he would tell people about his accident um, and how he'd spent eight months in hospital and how he learned to hate Fridays because Friday was intake day. And the new people would come in with their families, mothers, sons, daughters, and so on. And they'd be reminded of what they'd been through. Uh, and what they put their families through. So they learned to hide away on a Friday at the other end of the hospital. And he'd talk people through this, and then he'd say, beds were always full. Every week I was in, the beds were full. So, you know, my, my challenge to you 
is I will give you £10,000 in a briefcase if you can give me the name of any one person. And of course, the audience would say, well, we can't do that, Ian, you know. Don't be silly. And he'd say, well, go on, the beds will be full. You've got to stab at it. Have a go. And then, Don't be silly. And he'd say, quite. But I can tell you that the beds will be full. And I can also tell you that everybody out there is thinking exactly the same, you know, as the uh, same thought, which is, it won't be me. You know, I'm busy this weekend. I'm walking in the hills. I'm visiting the grandchildren. I'm, you know, running a marathon or whatever. I'm far too busy to be being paralyzed. But the point is, somebody somewhere will be wrong. You know, Heinrich's triangle, he'd take people back to Heinrich's triangle and he'd say, look, bottom of the triangle, top of the triangle. You know, the bigger the bottom, the bigger the top. Who, what, and where, we can't predict. But we can be pretty accurate about the numbers. And the same applies whether you're in your back garden on trampolines with your children or whether you're on the roads driving about. Every time you take a chance, every time you overtake when you think it's safe but you don't know it's safe, you're rolling the dice. And he'd leave it at that. The second point Ian used to make is that safety in the last analysis is incredibly simple. Uh, there hasn't yet been an accident in history that with the benefit of hindsight, we couldn't have thought of a reasonably simple way of stopping or a very simple way of stopping. Very obviously pertinent for this zero zero harm uh, that we're talking about today. And Ian's point was, if it's true that with the benefit of hindsight we could have stopped the accident, why don't we find a proactive way of stopping it before it happens? Yeah? Yeah? You know, because safety is really simple. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to finish with a, a true story that um, illustrates Ian's point in a way that I hope will finish the, uh, the session as the last, the last piece of, oh, with upbeat. Uh, but, but I need to check though. Uh, I, I would like to quote the New Zealander that, um, that I talked to. Does anybody <laughs> uh, object to me swearing at all? Anybody's going to be mortified if I swear because I want to quote the chap. Okay, well, I'll, I'll put your fingers in your ears if, 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 you, if you didn't like to say. Um, basically, I was in New Zealand and uh, I was driving along and I saw a sign that said skydiving here. So uh, I pulled in. I've always wanted to have a go at that. So I found the guy who ran it. He's a big ex all black kind of fella. And, uh, and I said, can I have a go at the skydiving, please? And he said, well, yeah, sure, mate, no problem. I, I personally will take you up. I will personally brief you on what you need to do. I personally will kit you out with the parachute that you need. Um, we'll get you over the drop zone. Boom, with any luck, you'll be back in your car in an hour. <laughs> and I said, well, hang on a minute. <laughs> you know, uh, that's a bit concerning. I'm from the UK. It's all a bit gung-ho for me. You know, back in, the, back in the, the UK, we'd have maybe a couple of days of training maybe a small test, you know, none of this take you up, throw you out nonsense, only I'm a bit concerned, you know, what happens if when it comes to it, I come over all peculiar and uh, get all flustered and forget what to do, and the big guy just kind of looked at me with pity and said, well, I fucking wouldn't if I were you, mate. <laughs> okay, okay, uh, and on that note, I'll say uh, thank you very much, thank you.